Welcome everyone to the August uh, Southern Fried DNN user group meeting. We are thrilled tonight to have a full house. We've got folks here in the Envisionative location in Mooresville, North Carolina. Woohoo! And uh, we have uh, a full house online. Uh, a lot of uh, friendly uh, usuals, uh, our friendly faces that we see all the time. And it sounds like uh, we also have some new folks in joining us. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, to everybody who's watching online uh, after the fact, uh, we're thrilled you joined us too. Uh, come see us. Of course, we're meeting the third Thursday of every month. And uh, when we kind of wrap up the meeting, we'll talk about uh, what's on tap for next month. But um, for today's meeting, we've got a good set of things to go through. Um, uh, to begin with, we have David Poindexter, who's going to spend some time talking about web components and a future path here for DNN. Uh, this is a topic that's relatively new to me, and uh, even last month when we were talking about it, I was uh, stretching to understand what we were talking about, so I'm really looking forward to a, to a full session here uh, to talk about that. Uh, so David will be our main presenter going through uh, information here in, uh, in a few moments. But as we do, normal structure, we're going to spend a little bit of time jumping into Community Buzz. Uh, we're going to have a, a section now that is a community member highlight, so in a moment we'll be uh, introducing and bringing online uh, Simon Hollerman, uh, who is an, uh, you know, an old-time DNN, uh, DNNer, uh, we used to call ourselves, uh, old-time DNNer, and he is back in the community now, and uh, we're looking forward to chatting with him for just a little bit. Uh, and then we'll, we'll run into things with, uh, with David. But we have a really uh, fun, exciting announcement uh, today in that we have a brand new sponsor who has come on board to help uh, support and show the love uh, back out to Southern Pride DNN user group. And uh, there's uh, some really exciting information we've got here along with a giveaway that's happening just tonight. So, uh, you know, the, the fact that we've got a loaded house uh, online uh, means that there's a lot of uh, good people who could possibly uh, win prizes here. Um, we are talking about the Caribbean Developers Conference. Uh, this is a conference that is actually only a few months away. Uh, October 24th through 26th in uh, Punta Cana. And uh, if you have been uh, heading out to uh, GNN conferences, Microsoft conferences, uh, you know, different uh, program language conferences, and they're in the cold or they're in the snow, then this is your chance to head out to a conference that is neither of those things. It is a Microsoft-based and focused uh, .NET rich conference, and it's in the warm, uh, lovely waters of Punta Cana. Um, main thing that I want to point out uh, about this conference is that it is a highly family-friendly conference. Uh, so one of the things they describe is that this is a great conference for you, a great adventure for them. And during the point of the conference, they have childcare, they have kids club, they have party zones. Uh, it's connected to uh, Hard Rock, so there's actually con concerts and things going on. I tried to follow the dates to see who was coming in and around that time, but there were Shakira concert tickets also involved with if you got the right package level of, of coming in. So I don't know if that's happening before or during or after, but... It looks like a great party, and the point is uh, that this conference is really structured uh, to have the whole family there. So in between you doing things for conference for a few days, uh, you meet up with the family and the kids at night, and uh, they've been doing fun stuff uh, during the daytime without you uh, as well. So um, we're thrilled to have the uh, Caribbean Developers Conference as a sponsor and for tonight um, as a special uh, you know, a special offering that they're giving to Southern Fried, which is really generous. Um, we have um, some promo codes and basically tickets uh, that are being given away that equal 20% off your um, package that you uh, book and then uh, free tickets to the conference. And the free tickets to the conference are a pretty darn good value. Actually, I'm struggling to remember. It's, it's 300 bucks? 200 bucks? Uh, 200 and... Uh $249 or something like that, $239 or something right. like that. So yeah. $250 or so uh, in uh, conference tickets. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if Andrew's going to be here uh, late, but uh, Andrew Heffling uh, was saying that he was going to this conference at one point. It's uh, you know maybe something where he uh, he gets some extra tickets uh, for heading down. I might, might want to mention that I believe Mike Smeltzer has his eyes on it as well. Oh, that is uh, fantastic. That might be why he's here tonight. I'm well, not sure. Well, we have... We have <laughs> Four tickets 
to, to give away. Um, that's highly generous of the Caribbean Delver Elders Conference, um, so we're thrilled to have them on as a new sponsor. We will come back to that at the end of the um, at the end of the session, and I don't know, Clint or David, if we have our reel of tickets. Uh, if we're going to do it that way, if we're going to do it a different way. Oh. So uh, <laughs> perhaps while we're all presenting and talking, Clint figures out uh, a ticket manner or a, uh, a mobile way to do that. Right, how are we going to get virtual people in the... Basically, we're going to run numbers uh, from people as what we've done in the past, uh, but then our, our picking of our ticket numbers. Um, all right. So um, heading into uh, heading into community hub um, buzz and information. Um, I always start off by heading to the community blog uh, to see new information on uh, what's been going on recently. And uh, before uh, before even wandering around to uh, to take a look at other things, I know the very first thing we should talk about. Uh, is the fact that uh, just after our last meeting, really, um, the DNN MVPs were announced. Uh, Clint, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I'll kind of scroll through some of this list and we'll, we'll yeah. give a shout out to regulars here of SoFry. Yes, yeah, so we kind of, I would refer to it as refresh the MVP program. That is, we uh, created honorary MVPs and lifetime MVPs, and we inducted a new batch of current MVPs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was good because there are a lot of people, uh, well, I'll just say there haven't been a new batch of MVPs inducted in like, what, three years? Maybe? Yeah, four years. Three or four years. So um, it was good. It was 100% community-driven. Uh, new MVPs were nominated by the community. And then they were voted on by current MVPs. So uh, if you scroll through the list there, you can see we've got several MVPs in the house and in attendance tonight. This year marks the first year where we have female MVPs. So uh, as Joe Craig was saying, we're no longer a quote-unquote boys club. So. Right, right. <laughs> but right, yeah, right. I would like to say congrats to David and Ryan and Mike and Addison and whoever else is on this meeting that I can't see that as and, Andrew anyone. regular. Yeah, uh, Andrew Daniel, Daniel is in there. Uh, so yeah, so it was good. We got a lot of people who've been contributing a lot uh, for you know a long time that haven't been you know recognized that are now recognized. So that was good to kind of get that program uh, up and going. So uh, inductions are once a year. Uh, the month for voting will be July, and then we announce in August. And so, like, if you are watching this and you want to be an MVP, then you need to contribute a lot throughout the year. Uh, Andrew Heffling is here, so welcome, Andrew. And, and then hopefully you can get nominated. So, um, yeah, so kudos to all the new MVPs. And I'm, I've got a roll of tickets here. I will be private messaging you with tickets, numbers, or the... All right. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, next big uh, community announcement um, is that we do have a new release. We have our new release of 9.2.1 uh, that was just put out now a week ago and some change. And uh, this release marks a pretty significant new difference, a, a change, uh, in that this release not only incorporated community elements, it was highly organized um, you know, by community members and participation. And uh, Mitch uh, might have spoken about that a little bit in the last um, session, but uh, you know, I, I think this is something to celebrate. This is, this is another one of the new buzz and new community activity things that you can look to to be proud of, to be excited about, because this isn't just uh, a release like all the past have been recently where uh, there's nothing community in it. There was uh, community contributions, there was community cleanup, there was a lot of discussion and participation. So to everybody who was participating in that, um, we in the community owe thanks. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of thanks to, to go around to the participants. Um, there's also some uh, good guiding in here, or, or I guess good measures or indication that if you want to see something change, you want to see something different, you want to talk about something you want to see in a future release of DNN, it's no longer something that's out of your reach. You can participate in the advisory group, you can participate in these conversations, and you can get changes that are important to you higher up on that list and moving forward. 
so this is uh, this is just part of the uh, new day for DNN that we're experiencing. So I'm uh, I'm thrilled about seeing you know what's come out of here 9.2.1. Any other thoughts on that, guys? Uh, so I've been over here working. I'm not sure if you covered <laughs> it, but the um, so this was a joint release, right? In the sense that. It was half community effort, half DNN Corp effort, and then the next release will be 100% community effort. Interesting. So in, the, in that new model, you know, Corp becomes another member of the community. Right. Greater than large ones, but a, a, another member just like uh, you and I. That is, that is perfect. That is perfect. Um, okay, um, Clint, I'm going to head back over to the community blog. Um, we obviously have, uh, as the community blog, is the location to go to see recaps on uh, different advisory group meetings, uh, to see posts that have been put up recently. Uh, Andrew Heffling put out just recently uh, DNN as an Azure web app um, as a post uh, just the other morning, and that also kind of followed in on some questions and um, help that I saw that he was giving to uh, some community members that were asking questions. Um, so that one is is a good one. Um, I think we'll give it maybe another day or two and see if it gets translated into Spanish. And then, then Andrew, yeah. you can know that it uh, it crossed that threshold of yeah. importance there. We we had Ernst Peter. He translated mm -hmm. one into I believe Dutch, Dutch, Dutch or something. And then I that. Alessandra Davies with T Works. She has volunteered to uh, start Portuguese. translating into Portuguese. So, and um, that that Portuguese stemmed from all I did was to start. You know, I was doing the thank yous on mm -hmm. Facebook, and I just said, hey, thanks for translating. And I was like, if anybody wants to. Yeah, it. yeah. And she's like, yeah, I want to do it. So, Hot dog. Um, yeah, we got a new language. And, no. But her, her only thing was, she's like, I don't know what I should translate. I was like, just watch Francisco and EPT and whatever. They do. <laughs> Copy them. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're translating, quote, unquote, like high-value blocks. Yeah. Right? Sure. So if you get a block translated, then you That's are a good mark. in the upper tier of <laughs> Well, I will say you mentioned uh, Andrew's blog yes. just recently posted. It's actually a really good blog. You know, uh, if you've ever struggled uh, to get DNN up and running in Azure, this should really help you out. So it's really good. Yeah, if I can say something really quick about this blog. So Please this, do. Go ahead. This isn't running DNN in an Azure server. This is running DNN in an Azure web app with Azure SQL, which is quite a different concept if you've never hosted anything in Azure. They have a lot of utilities that uh, abstract away the service for you so you can focus more on managing your, your application instead of managing a Windows server. So this is all about getting it working in that Azure web app model. All right. Do y'all want me to put y'all in here? No. Yeah. No. Um, all right. Um, so Clint, any other ones that I should highlight or pick back up to? Go back to the list and just yep. scroll a little bit. Um, you obviously had your August uh, digest. Uh, anything from that uh, that we pull out? That well, be so, a, I mean, ITX is having a conference that's specifically focused on UI UX. It's called Beyond the Pixels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's in Rochester. They, they're they actually hosting it at kind of like a, I want to say it's a artsy place. They maybe like art museum or something. That Jared School guy, he's the keynote. Like they got some oh, yeah. big names nice. up there. Um, it's called Beyond the Pixels. I didn't mention it in DNN and Digest. So, like, if you uh, if you're into UI UX and in the New York area or want to travel there, uh, I think it's coming up here in a couple of weeks. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's Jared School is big time. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And uh, they talk like they want to make it an annual uh, event. So that's good. All right. Well, we can come back and pick up uh, other. Uh, community buzz, community things um, towards the end of the session if we need to. Um, it's never too often and too late uh, to mention uh, DNN Summit. Of oh, course, yeah. we have DNN Summit. Uh, we have DNN Summit uh, that has been announced and uh, behind the scenes, the committee, committee? And uh, <laughs> volunteers are uh, already starting to put in hours. Um, I myself have already racked up a half a week of hours uh, working on things and organizing things for DNN Summit. Uh, you may not realize how much work goes into starting things off and getting them to run even vaguely smoothly uh, when we get down there. But uh, we already have uh, the committee and the volunteers uh, starting to do that work. And so uh, many of us that are on the call uh, here today and uh, and the volunteers who participated in the past, they're they're starting to move those move those cogs.
So um, we have a few different things. Uh, one is that uh, registration isn't open yet, of course. Uh, that'll be next month. But we have already put out our call for speakers. Uh, so if you submitted last year and you are interested in submitting the same session again because it didn't get picked, or you've got some new ideas, um, or you've never spoken before and you want to uh, get some encouragement, uh, reach out to any of us and we'll tell you how awesome it is and, and how um, enjoyable it is uh, to speak about something you're passionate about and see the light go on for people who are there with you as uh, they start to catch some of that excitement too. Uh, it's, it's always worth it. Um, but so Call for Speakers uh, is through the same platform uh, that we used uh, last year that's managed by Mitch and uh, so basically as you go through you're able to submit one session or ten different sessions. Uh, the only thing we ask is that you put in enough good detail for us to understand what the session is going to be about. Um, spend some time, put together a little bit of an intro paragraph and some bullet points about what it would be about or put together the whole syllabus about what the hour long presentation is going to be about. Um, but if you at least give us a start, then when we go through uh, voting and picking on those, uh, we'll be able to select you and get you into uh, a speaker position for DNN Summit. Any, anything else uh, for that? Uh, there was a sort of a question yeah. uh, in the chat about hotel discounts, and I, I think the answer is those have not been set up quite yet. Correct. So wait a little bit longer yeah. on that. Uh, just got call, a speak, uh, call for speakers out. Um, yeah, I guess that was last week uh, or early this week or something yeah. like that. But, uh, so but yeah, that'll be coming soon, uh, I think. Yeah, Ho hotel has not been announced yet. Uh, obviously, we're doing the same structure as the past, so we'll have uh, the main hotel in Denver and then uh, the um, slopes um, up in Winter Park, and that's going to be then lodge uh, locations. Many times the lodge locations are ones where we're all grouping up uh, and, and doubling up and quadrupling up in rooms. Uh, so start talking early about who you might want to room with. Even if you don't know where you're going yet, you can get a group together because uh, that makes it very affordable. Um, but um, as far as the travel is concerned, just throwing out there, uh, Dave and I have both uh, tried different ways to buy early and to buy late on those plane tickets. And at least coming here from the Charlotte area of North Carolina, uh, it does not pay to wait. Uh, those tickets just keep going up and they never come back down again. So uh, the sooner you buy tickets, the better it is. Uh, we, started, we, we live in the Northeast and upstate New York, and we the prices are already extremely high, so we're already booking our flights. Yep, yep. I, I was thinking that I'm going to book my flight here in the next month. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, DNN Summit, and uh, that takes us on to our next um, section of the meeting uh, today. Uh, we are going to do a community member spotlight, a small interview and, uh, and discussion with Simon Holloman. Uh, Simon Holloman is an old DNNer. Uh, you, you might have run across him in the past, uh, back in... Uh, earlier days, 2008, 2009, he was around in the community. He's located out in, uh, I, I'm, let me know if this is wrong, uh, son, but uh, Adelaide. Um, yeah, Australia. that's correct. Adelaide, he is on the uh, far west side of Australia there. And uh, he, uh, you know, was in the DNA community, participating in a lot of things. And then uh, we kind of didn't hear from him for a while. And he's come back into the community now. And uh, we thought it would be a great time to uh, have him you know, stop by and talk to us about what he sees, you know, getting that perspective from knowing and having an established, you know, view of what DNN is and then going, hey, and then paying attention again. Uh, we feel there's a lot of buzz and activity going on, but uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, uh, Simon, your perspective about what you see coming back in and seeing uh, a lot more activity than there was in the past. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, no, as you mentioned, I was part of the community back in sort of 2006 through to, well, probably 2008, 2009 actively. Um, uh, as you can probably see from the screen, we're a web hosting company in Australia. Um, back when we started, there weren't too many ASP.NET sort of Windows-based hosting companies. So, um, and the ones that were there were, were fairly poor support and uh, and fairly expensive so so we thought well, we'll, we'll you know we'll set up a, a hosting company and um, 
and one of the core, I guess, kind of products that we were focusing on uh, was .NET Nuke. Uh, we established a bit of a, uh, you know, some creds as a, as a fairly good uh, .NET Nuke hosting company in Australia. Uh, and had quite a few people sort of coming on board. That was back in the, the late .NET UK 3, early .NET UK 4 days, I guess. Um, yeah, so, you know, we we had a lot of .NET UK sites running. They ran well. We did some consulting, a little bit of, uh, you know, some module development, some skin development, as it's called back then. Mm -hmm. um, but we found that, Sort of when when it started to get into the era of .NET Nuke 5 and then through into .NET Nuke 6, um, that the performance was starting to suffer on the product. Um, the the resource usage um, seemed to explode, sort of from version 4 to version 5 and 6. Um, being a hosting company, obviously you know the amount of RAM that a a web application takes up uh, directly affects our bottom line. So. Um, you know, if we're pushing uh, a product that is taking up, you know, 500 meg of RAM just running a base install, um, yep. whereas a, a, an off-the-shelf ASP.NET application, you know, might run it at 60 or 80 meg, then, you know, it's it's a significant sort of overhead. So we started to, I guess, move away from really focusing on .NET Nuke. Um, shortly after that, MVC uh, was released sort of, you know, a few years later. Uh, a lot of people swayed towards that, and that, that was very lightweight, and that was sort of perfect for us as a, um, I guess, as a, as a platform from, from the hosting side of the business. From the development side, um, that fell in line with kind of what we were doing as well. Um, we were doing less, I guess, websites and more web applications, kind of line of business type web applications that, um, you know, that had a, less of a re less of a requirement for user management, role management, that type of thing. So, yeah. so it was, it was, I guess, a bit of an organic kind of move away from from the platform. Um, but as I said, we, we've always had customers running .NET Nuke. Uh, on our platform, we've always, you know, helped with them, work with them, and and that sort of thing. And recently, uh, a few months ago, a customer sort of dropped me an email and said, "Oh, look, we've got this big project coming up. Do you do you know anyone who does .NET Nuke development?" And I uh -huh. said, "Well, kind of, yeah. You know, we do, um, but you know, we haven't looked at it for for a little while." Um, and and I kind of jumped back in, and and that must have been just after the 9.2 release. Um, and I, you know, I fired up a new site, and I was look, I was blown away by what I saw. You know, the um, the improvements in the the performance and and you know the core uh, so, you know system were, were fantastic. I love the Persona Bar. Um, you know, I think that's it's a great way of management. It kind of gets the management out of your way, um, and yeah, it went really well. So. I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I've got a little blog that, uh, you know, I've got some really, really old articles on and haven't updated it anywhere near as much as I should. But I thought, well, I'll, I, I absolutely hate WordPress, but, you know, I'd, I'd thrown it on WordPress a few years ago. So I thought, well, I'll bring that across to, to .NET Nuke. And, and, you know, one of the things that uh, the community seems to have picked up on is, you know, w once I moved it across, I was, I was amazed because I had a, I had a fairly stock standard WordPress installation with a with a free theme which didn't have many plugins and it was running sort of 1.5 to 2 seconds per page and just a you know .NET 9.2 out of the box with a a free theme on it um, and a blog module was was you know bringing out pages at about 120 milliseconds so it was a, just a phenomenal performance increase and you know I honestly thought my monitoring, monitoring was wrong for a start so <laughs> I, went, I went and checked some stuff and and you know the you know the, the the servers were literally running next to each other on the on the same host on the, in the same data center you know the, the databases servers were running the same specs well obviously one's MySQL yeah. one's SQL Server um, you know the web servers were were basically identical, um, yeah. And obviously, you know you've got a, you know you can't absolutely compare apples with apples. But you know, as I said, they were both fairly stock standard installations, and it was 
the, the performance difference was just phenomenal. And, uh, you know, you've got the speed side up there at the moment. I'm just sort of having a look at, I've got sort of continual monitoring on the speed. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that's that's coming back at about 122 milliseconds. Um, you know, and that's got oh, 15 extensions it's installed and, um, yeah. It's just it's, it's just gonna get fast. better too. Like um, one of the pull requests that Mitchell just made, and yes. David, you can explain yeah. it better than I can. But the performance is, is gonna get better. Yeah. Yeah. During that time period where you were out, um, you had you had at least two major pushes that were about performance. And so there yeah. was a set of pushes at seven, another set of pushes at eight that were yeah. focused just on the core on performance on cleaning yeah. out stuff that was uh, old and, and around and, and getting that out of the way. So yeah. um, you kind of, uh, you kind of you missed the, the, the incremental and you, you got to the end result of... Yeah, uh, well, that's, you know, that's the way around. to do it, I suppose. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, as I said, we did some module development back then and, and it's something we're keen to get back in on now. I'm an, I'm an MVC developer, so it's good to, to have that in the in the. Uh, the framework now, and I'm I'm keen to investigate some of the the SPA stuff with React and Angular and some of those uh, client side uh, frameworks. Simon so, meets Andrew, and Andrew meets Simon. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I haven't done a bit like that. I've sort of, you know, um, I've been harassing Dave the last few months, uh, the last few weeks, trying to you know get my head around npm and gulp and and uh, and that sort of thing. You know, all the package managers and and uh, task runners and that sort of thing, which you know I've not done a lot with. So uh, you know, um, and just having having the availability now to, to talk to people like you guys in, in forums like this and, you know, on Slack and um, and Twitter and Facebook groups and that is, is phenomenal. You know, it just opens the community up to um, something that, you know, just wasn't there last time I was part of the community. As I said, I had to, you know, I had to fly 3,000 kilometres to, you know, to Las Vegas to kind of meet people who were, who were in the .NET New community back in uh, 2009, so... Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we are thrilled to have you back in. Um, we are Thank you. Talking, we're talking often enough with new uh, with folks who are coming back in, you know, after uh, you know doing different things for a little while. Uh, sometimes it's stories similar to yours, where technology just took them elsewhere. Other times, they just completely did something else for a few years, and they're thrilled to see what's what's back in. Um, uh, to me and, and, and David, certainly the, a lot of what we're talking about at events like this is that buzz, that excitement that all mm. kicked off last year, uh, last year about this time. Mm. And so it's a, it's a good time to be in. It's, it's a good time to be coming back in. Yeah, no, um, definitely. Like I said, I, I, think I, I think I jumped back in just at the right time. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess, I, uh, you know, I get to take the benefit of all your, your hard work over the last 10 years. Oh well, it comes at a price. We're going to put you to work. You will, uh, <laughs> you you'll start contributing real soon. We're it's, yeah. it's, it's going to turn full circle. No, that's fine. Happy to do so. Right. Well, Simon, uh, thank you. What's we'll taking, Andrew? Uh, Simon, I hear you like MVC. Yeah. Yes. Simon, Andrew, yeah. Andrew meet Simon. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, no, I, yeah, well, that, that, that's, yeah, uh, that's when my, uh, uh, until I stuff up my uh, dev install and uh, my routes just stop working for random reasons, but, uh, you know, we got past that, and, uh, yeah, no, um, I, I like MVC, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of, it's just sort of cut down enough and just powerful enough for what I want, so now I've just got to try and, Weave my skills into into utilizing it within .NET Nuke. So, yeah. All right. Well, Simon, thanks very much for joining us, and we'll, no we'll have you here. Uh, That's what I was looking at. Today. <laughs> oh no, I I have I have the chat windows closed. Um, okay, so um, we are switching now to the main uh, topic for the evening. We have uh, David with Envisionative. Uh, spending some time telling us about uh, what, to me, is a new concept, a new direction to head here 
Uh, we are talking about web components and a future uh, future path to integrating them into uh, into DNN. So uh, with that uh, here, David, we're going to swap over, take the screen, and uh, I'll start making my questions here in a second. If you can tell people on. If they're not paying attention to chat, they should because I see mm. their numbers in a private message. That's, that's a good point. So we do have our giveaway here at the end of the meeting from the Caribbean Developers Conference. Uh, we have four tickets. I uh, spent just a second glancing at the notes, and unless I've read it wrong, all members of Southern Pride have a 20% off um, 20% off code for lodging and, uh, and travel. Um, however, we are giving way beyond that uh, four uh, tickets to the conference. Uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we have a good giveaway there, and the way we're doing it electronic for everyone online is Clint is posting to you numbers, so be paying attention to the chat so that you can get your number and, uh, and be ready for the end. They, they, they've already been given, so if you don't see them, scroll back up. Bingo. Got it. All right, David, take, uh, take it away. Excellent. Everybody see the screen okay? We do. Okay, great. We do. I will not be monitoring chat, so if you guys could let me know if there's any will questions do. that come up through this. But I want to talk about an, an interesting subject that, I mean, has really been gaining a lot of traction in the web dev space, and that is uh, web components. The first, uh, for any of you that do not know me, uh, I am the CEO of Envisionative, and we are a creative marketing and app development company located here in the Charlotte, North Carolina area in the U.S. of A. Co-president of Southern Fried as well and uh, on the board of directors for DNN Connect, which is the European Association. Uh, put on an event each year in uh, Europe. And a few other things, I'll let you browse through those things, but um, really uh, – my foray, I guess, into really getting into open source was NB QuickSight. So many of you probably know of that tool to help you install DNN locally and configure it in less than a minute. Um, and it's just kind of grown from there. And I'll eventually be talking a little bit about uh, another thing we've got going on in the NB Quick world here. So what we'll be covering today is we're going to look at the JavaScript condition a little bit. You've heard people talk about the human condition. Well, I'm going to talk about the JavaScript condition today. And uh, we're going to look into web components, some of the different flavors of web components that are out there and what's new on the scene, the big new shiny object. Uh, we'll talk about what's available in browsers today um, as it relates to these, this new technology and some tooling uh, to create those and We'll jump into, at that point, the new NB Quick components, which is really in its empty stage at this point. And this is more of an introductory type uh, presentation on what the ideas are, what the initial efforts are, and what we're looking to do in, in the future as time comes on uh, as it relates to this technology. And then we'll take a look at that and really bring it full circle back to what that means or could mean for DNN today and in the future. So let's talk about the JavaScript condition here and uh, what's often referred to as framework turn. So this uh, next image is a, a little bit outdated, uh, so if you're a view person, don't, don't hate on me on this, <laughs> but uh, you, you see some of the top JavaScript frameworks that are out there right now. And you, you, you'll notice a few of these, Angular, React, uh, you'll see the uh, Ember and Vue.js, and I believe this other one is, oh my gosh, I always have a trouble with that symbol because it looks like something else, but it's, uh, oh, somebody help me out here. It's drawing a blank. The one to the Andrew. left of Vue? Yeah, the one to the left of Vue. It's, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway. Razor blades. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> not that one. But, um, you know, it, the list really is much, much bigger and even much, much bigger than this uh, visual here that I've got on the screen. The, the thing is the these frameworks are coming about so fast. They're evolving so fast. They each have their pros and cons. They, you know, one will do some things better than another, and, you know, what you find is it's kind of like uh, devs are becoming creatives, right? You know, if it's creatives, we, we look at something and we go, oh, oh, 
butterfly. You know, or, you know, and there's there's something else that comes along, and it's a, you know, you want to go and look at that new thing that that's come along. Devs are a lot like that, and if you are trying to keep up in the JavaScript world, I mean, it all kind of started probably around the jQuery time frame when you know it was really the first. You could argue it's not really a framework, more of a library, but you know it it, it came along and it has just skyrocketed from there. And uh, some of the top players in that, of course, in Angular and React and Vue is definitely becoming a strong contender in that world. And Ember, Ember's kind of been in that, that space for a long time, too, and uh, highly valued in some, some segments versus others. But it's, it's, it's a turn, right, you know, to keep up. I mean, who can keep up with all this? Um, I, I certainly can't. Uh, I, I love Angular, I love Vue, can't stand React, you know, but I still have to know a little bit about it. But it, there's no way I can keep up with even the things that I love the most. Um, you know, it's, it, it seems like there's every week there's something significant happening in each one of these framework spaces. Addison said that was a backbone, JS. Backbone, thank you. I knew it was, I wanted to say serve or something, but it was <laughs> backbone, that's right. Daniel was nodding his head yeah. uh, in, in absolute agreement that you, it's almost something significant every single week, and he started smiling and nodding, yep. It is. It's, you know, your head could spin if you, it, you know, if you're on Twitter or something like that that's, that's posting content, you know, about these different segments of, you know, the JavaScript world, all you have to do is sit there for 30 minutes and you already feel like you can't keep up with what's going on. Um, it's just, just so much happening. A lot of cool things. I mean, you know, the, the flip side of that is it's very exciting. So it's becoming less and less about knowing one thing so incredibly well and becoming the subject matter expert in that and doing it. It's like, okay, what tool is the right one for this particular job? Okay, what tool is the right one for this job? Okay. But let's shift on into a rather new uh, kind of ideal or specification, I say, is ultimately going to be uh, in the, in the uh, W3C space is web components. If you have not taken a look into web components, then I've got a URL here up on the screen at webcomponents.org slash introduction. It's a great real quick way to kind of get up to speed on what some of this new stuff really is. And we're going to go into looking at some of these things in a, at a service level. Of course, there's a lot of complexities, but don't be overwhelmed. I, I just want to kind of encourage you here a little bit because I know when I was first looking at this, I kept on hearing people talk about it, and I'm like, okay, but what is the big deal? I don't really get it. You know, I was thinking it was this other framework, if you will, you know, to go and try to learn or some code or some syntax or something. It really isn't that at all. We'll get into what it really is, but I highly encourage you, if you are in the web world, you need to know about web components because they are here to stay. They're part of the HTML specification coming up and Everything is evolving into this, even these frameworks that we're talking about on um, the previous slide here and the one before that, you know, they're even finding ways to leverage these new capabilities within the browser. So let's take a step back here for just a minute and look at components in general, the concept of components. If you are familiar with some framework like Angular, I've got an example here on the screen of what a component looks like in Angular, okay? This is in the Angular world. Mm -hmm. This component does not work in the React world. It doesn't work in pure JavaScript. Mm -hmm. You have to have Angular Look to utilize this component. But the concept is very similar to what we're talking about when we talk about web components. It's just within the scope and context of Angular. So what you see here on the screen is a component um, uh, decorator here in a TypeScript file. You have a selector. That's really kind of like the name of the component. Then you've got a template URL. 
that really is the path to the HTML that that component is going to render, okay? And then you've got a provider which is attaching it to some service, okay, that can perform actions and so forth as it relates to this component. And then you've got a class, and don't worry about all this, I'm not trying to teach class on Angular here, but then you've got some on init function. And what that does is it actually does whatever the component needs to do, mm -hmm. all right, whatever you want it to do. So when we're building Angular apps, we're creating Angular components for various small segmented features, sometimes complex, but most of the time they're very small features. We want this component to do something, like a date picker, for instance. Um, so we would create a component for a date picker or utilize somebody else's component for a date picker that is made for Angular. We would plug that in, and then in the HTML, which is down at the bottom below the box, you would be able to use what looks like HTML, but it is called, it's really an element that instantiates or allows that component to render on the page. And then you've got all this tight script behind it. It's really doing the heavy lifting and so forth. So the concept has been there. The same concept is in React. The same concept is in Vue. They're all component-based models for the most part. You build a component for one thing. You use it in your front-end code for that, uh, for that app that you're building, and it renders that component and does what you need it to do. Let's shift over into web components now and what is different about web components than those. Web components are framework independent. What I mean by that is a component that you create as a web component can be used in any framework or no framework. It could be in pure JavaScript and HTML and it does everything that you need it to do. So I'm not sure if the light bulb is going on a little bit now, but it's like, okay, if I can create components that are pure JavaScript, not some JavaScript library or framework like Angular, and I can use that component in multiple apps that use different frameworks, then I've got something a bit more powerful there, right? I can now use that exact same component in multiple applications regardless of what framework they're using. So it becomes quite powerful. The web components are made up of four specifications. As of the 1.0 specification, they contain custom elements, HTML imports, HTML templates, and something called the Shadow DOM. Ooh, <laughs> that sounds cool, right? We're going to see what that does a little bit later on. I think that was a secret organization in Mask, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I, don't, I don't know what the Shadow DOM was. <laughs> it sounds cool. That's all I know. Okay. The, uh, I, some, the icon makes me think like this matches with self-destruction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know. It makes me feel like I'm a spy, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm able to kind of hide something from the from the rest of the world, and that's actually what it really is. Okay. So it's uh, really, really neat. So let's shift into what one of these specifications is. And again, we're scraping the surface here, but at its root, this is what we're talking about. A custom element is a fully featured custom DOM element, document object model. All right, if you've been around the web dev world for any length of time, you know and have grown to love and hate the DOM. The DOM is a tree of information that's related to that page, and you can navigate through that tree and go off on different branches and see little elements that are down in there. Well, custom elements are fully featured, but they're custom mm -hmm. elements that can be used in pure HTML. So if I flip back and I look at that Angular example I was showing you, we've got the element app-hero-list. Well, the syntax is the same, but like we were mentioning back here, I can't take that HTML and put it into a pure HTML JavaScript you know, website. Without, without Angular. Exactly, without Angular, it won't work. 
here, my dash custom dash element will work not only in pure HTML and JavaScript, it'll also work in Angular, it'll also work in Vue, it'll also work in any of these elements. All right. It is also extensible. By that, I mean we can put properties on it, like my custom property, and we can have values associated with it. We can put some stuff inside of it, you know, into the actual inner HTML of it. We can do a lot of cool shiz with this. That's the way I like to look at it. You may say, yeah, what's the big deal? Why do I want to create custom elements? i got enough HTML now. Well, no, you really want to do something very specific sometimes. So, and you want to be able to reuse that in other environments. So this becomes quite, quite powerful. The next specification is HTML imports. What this is, is, you know, uh, you may look at this and you say, well, we've had this for a long time. Well, we, we sort of have and we, we really haven't. Um, what this is, I can now, you know how you use a link in HTML to link to some other resource like a CSS file or a JavaScript file. Well now, HTML import specifications allows me to now link to custom elements. It's a way right. to do embedded links of whatever your code is. It's to reference that custom element okay. and link to it, just like you would with a CSS with file CSS or something like that. Linked versus embedded versus inline. Exactly. So, okay. Exactly. And you can link external resources too. So this is very simple, mm -hmm. but it opens it up to a whole new world because now I can do that with custom elements. All right? Okay. The next specification is HTML templates. What this is is interesting because it is what it says. I mean, it is a template. It's a snippet or, you know, a, a certain section of HTML that you want to use in multiple places. So it is a template in that sense. I mean, I've just got basic HTML here. I've got uh, an image tag uh, that's referencing some great image. And I've got a div here with a class called comment on it. But I'm wrapping it in a template. Now, the interesting thing about HTML templates is if I put that on the HTML document, it will not render. All right? Okay. It right. won't render. That HTML that's inside of that template will not render. Mm -hmm. But I can still put it on the HTML document and I can use it. The only way that it renders is if it is inserted into the HTML document via JavaScript. Okay. All right. So I've got a little JavaScript snippet here where, um, you know, if you know JavaScript, we're just doing a query selector here to find the template ID attribute called my template, right? So we're going to find that element, and we're going to populate something inside of it which in this case is an image tag. We're going to set the source attribute of that image tag to logo.png from JavaScript. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to create a, a variable called clone, and we're going to use a, a function called import node. T is our actual template, right? That's the ID. We, we created that in var t up there, and we're going to set import to be true. So then we can, through JavaScript, inject clone into the body of the document. So this is a way to now kind of have templating built right into the raw, pure HTML world in JavaScript. No longer are you having to rely, and I'll quickly kind of relate this to the DNN world, for, for instance. Right now, a lot of the modules that are on the market um, and open source ones as well use some sort of templating engine, right? There has to be some engine. Some people use RazorScript. Some people uh, use Token Replace. You've probably seen it. If any of you use news articles by Ventrian or... Easy DNA news, you know, that they use token-based templates. Template, yeah. It's HTML, mm -hmm. 
and it's just some engine that replaces words that are inside of brackets or a kind of syntax that's been created in there, and it replaces those with actual stuff. Well, think about it now. HTML templates, we have the ability to do that. We don't have to have an engine anymore. It's built right into the, JavaScript the actual running. specification. We can do it right in pure HTML and JavaScript now. So, David, this may be a good point for me to interject. Pete has a question that says, could a gifted developer write a component and essentially remove the need for module, but a module that would work in WordPress, Drupal, and DNL? Absolutely. Um, that, that's the short answer to that. You could have a web component that I could drop into WordPress, which is PHP based, right? I just put that into, I could wrap it in the context of a plugin in, in WordPress if I wanted to, mm -hmm. but it's literally the exact same code as I could put into a DNN module and wrap it as a ASDX yeah. file or whatever, you know, and put it in that way, or a spa module or uh, an MVC module. That's the power here. So think about this from a, uh, let's say you're a commercial extension developer. You want to write something that works in DNN and WordPress. Well, guess what? You should probably be looking into web components here because that's what's going to allow you to quickly do that and reuse all the same code and just the wrapper is different. All right, so we got a flurry. Andrew's got a question <laughs> that he's going to speak, and Daniel's asking what is current support in browsers. Yeah. All right, I'm going to get to the latter one there. Yeah. So if Andrew, if you want to uh, raise your question. Yeah, so this is really cool stuff. Uh, my big question is, going back to the templating engines that different people have used, I primarily work in the MVC world where templating is done server-side, not client-side. And mm. I was wondering if you put some thought into how this plays into something like MVC where our AAP.NET server is going to template out and generate the HTML and then send that over to the client. Yep, you are going to love what I'm going to show you a little bit later on. Okay. I can wait. <laughs> If I do not address your question at that point, please bring Come this back, back up and we'll talk about it. But I'll, I will address that specifically, I believe, later on. Right. Okay, so we've talked about three of the specifications under Web Components. Let's talk about the fourth one, the mysterious shadow DOM. Can I hear the music? Cue it, right? So I don't have any code to show here because, well, it's in the shadows. Yeah. Open thing. Come on, laugh, Ryan. You gotta laugh. Come on, man. Help the brother out here. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So we talked about what the DOM was earlier. It's really a bunch of, you know, it's a tree of information, you know, with a bunch of branches and stuff. Well, what the shadow DOM <laughs> is is you're able to attach a DOM subtree two elements within a web document. So it becomes its own little mini DOM, if you will, or shadow DOM within the DOM. All right, you may say, well, what's the big deal? It's just another nested element in the DOM. No, it's actually not another nested element in the DOM. It's actually its own shadow DOM. It's in the secret. It's in the dark space. It's in the dark web. Not really. That was just a shadow. <laughs> shadow DOM was invented by Facebook to censor people. No, okay. <laughs> so, right. so what this is, that these, these little subtrees, I, I'm, I'm making too many jokes here, but these subtrees are encapsulated. They are literally in their own little DOM structure. They are not dependent on the other DOM. They're just attached to it. All right? And... You can st the style information that's inside of these is scoped is inside scoped. of itself. Exactly, that's the okay. best way to put that. And I was okay. not going to use that word, but that is a perfect word. It is scoped to where those styles cannot apply to any elements in its master DOM. Okay, mm -hmm. pretty cool. All right. We'll, we'll talk about what that really means a little bit later on and yeah, what the application of that is. But. The immediate thing is that then you can stack up bunches of different templates together and they won't interfere with each other. So you can just bring your list mm -hmm. of things and know that you've worked on this and styled it well, you've worked on that and styled it well, throw 10 of them on a page together and they're not going to compete with each other. That's exactly right. So 
How many of you have ever put something into a solution and then you realize, well, let's talk about it in the DNN space. You put it into a site and it does not look the way that it did on mm. another site. Yep. And you go, well, why not? Oh, and then you realize, oh, this theme is based on foundation CSS framework, whereas the other one was based on Bootstrap, and the developer took advantage of some Bootstrap stuff that they did not even think about foundation. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in that situation. So think about this, that now our little components have styling in of themselves. They, they could be dependent on an external framework if you wanted them to be, or they can completely isolate it so that they look exactly the same way in one versus the other. All right? So those are the four specifications within web components. The other question that came up a few minutes ago was browser support. So let's take a look at browser support. This is what it is as of today. And you'll see these four elements. You'll also see one thing here, this ES modules. That is a concept. Um, you know, if you, any of you look at the ES, uh, the, the whole JavaScript, pure JavaScript world, the ES modules is a concept inside of there. That's actually kind of part of the whole web components world a bit. But in the, for the sake of our conversation, you've got HTML templates. They are stable release in Chrome, Opera, Safari, Firefox, and Edge. You mean current? What stable means, yes, current. That means that you can use HTML templates today in any of these browsers, and it will work in a native sense. All right? Same is true for HTML imports. That works today in all of those browsers. All right? And when you see things like uh, Firefox, <laughs> that means both in PC and Mac. Okay, so that's all Firefox. Now, let's look specifically at custom elements in Shadow DOM. <clears throat> what you'll see is polyfill is a green in Firefox and Edge. Now, what the heck is a polyfill? 3D rendering? What are we talking about? Yes, exactly. So this is, it actually, what they'll do what? is they have a bat fail safe way to render. It's just that they're not rendering natively using pure custom elements in its specification. Like as a second subroutine so then renders it after the fact, and so yeah, it might be slower. It will work, might... exactly. Okay. That's, okay, so if you've done some development where you've had to use polyfills, it, it's a fairly small JavaScript add you know, to it to, to have polyfill support. A lot of applications use polyfills today to do these more advanced things in HTML. Um, but it is not the fastest. It's not slow right. by any means. And it doesn't not work. Right. It works. It works. It's just, it's just that it is not working natively. So this is probably a really awful analogy. But I Back in the early uh, HTML4 revolution, um, there were things where we had to deal with that. There were certain things that worked, but they didn't work natively. Heck, PNGs were like that at one point in time. Right. So exactly. I, we it's had, the same kind of we've thing. We've had that same kind of thing in the past uh, until the browsers catch up. Well, just look at JPEGs. There what? are so many yeah. flavors of JPEGs. I mean, when you get down to the to the actual compression algorithms that okay. are used, sure, and things sure. like JPEG is very different than JPG is very different than you know some of the other many algorithms that are in there. It's the same kind of concept. It may have supported rendering it, but it may not have rendered it in its purest and fastest right. way. Okay. All right, so that's what these polyfills are now. So can you make a custom element today natively and it actually work in Firefox and Edge? Absolutely. 100% okay. it will work. It will just not be working native. Now, I was starting to make a pretty bad analogy, um, but it's, it's along the same lines of what you're talking about. But if you think about mobile apps these days, mobile apps are either native code, so on Apple it's built in either Objective-C or Swift, 
That is a native experience. It's close to the metal, all that code, right? Or it could be hybrid. And hybrid is a web view that kind of sits on top of that, and you have some layer like Cordova that talks to those native features. So not quite as fast, but it works, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of similar to that. Polyfill is kind of like Cordova is okay. to, right. to, to native uh, bulk. Really but, but bad analogy. For, for that but, analogy, though, you have to... You have to bring in those things to then do it. That's right. but here, it's the browser. Here. It's built in. You're not having yes. to call anything to make it polyfill. That's correct. Do you have to load anything in the document to tell it to look for these things coming up or anything? Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but yeah, I mean, okay. what happens is it depends on how you create these uh -huh. uh, web components. But and how you instantiate them? No, not really. I okay. mean, just having them there will automatically pull in a polyfill JavaScript, uh -huh. you know, okay. dependency, if you will, right. uh, that comes into it. It's very small, though, by the way. Um, uh, we had a couple of questions before you leave this yeah, page because sure. I sense you're, you're heading out. A Andrew did have a question and then he kind of back said, wait, never mind, he, he answered it. Um, and then uh, um, Addison also had some reactions on, on the page as well. So I want to open it up to the group before we leave this page. Are there any more questions about the, the current browser support and, and what we see here? Yes, uh, just, uh, just to clarify, for, and I think you answered this already, but polyfill means that it supports everything that the other ones do. It's just a little slow. Andrew, I'm so sorry, but that did not, it was a little, louder, a little, maybe. little soft for us. Sorry. So the, um, for like Edge, for example, where it says polyfill, it, do, it does everything that Safari does for like the custom elements. It's just a little slower, right? That's correct. 100%. Uh, one of the other questions uh, was, you know, what we see Edge here. How about IE? Can we say IE 11? I just will what discount that? that. Yeah, I'll just discount that out of hand. But um, Well, the, the, the short of it is it probably should be on this list. I pulled this list off of webcomponents.org. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting that they didn't list it. <laughs> <laughs> but they must view it as fairly irrelevant at this point because of market share, I guess. My guess, though, I mean, I don't know how you guys have been, but uh, IE is not bad these days. I mean, I am <laughs> oh, it's Yeah, it's, it's pretty concurrent um, most of the time. My guess is they have a lot of it, but I have not done that research, so I can't speak definitively about its support. My guess is it will at least support this stuff from Polyfield because there's no reason why it would at this point. Because that's been around for a long time, Polyfill. Okay, so we've now covered what a web component is, what that, what the four specifications within web components are. Let's talk a little bit about how you would go about creating a web component. There are quite a few tools out there. Probably one of the first on the scene is the one on the bottom left here, and that's Polymer. Um, it gained a lot of traction real quick. Um, a lot of, you know, this, I guess you could probably see this stuff is not rocket science, but yet it is a bit mysterious because it's kind of like, uh, you know, we're focused on developing applications these days, right? You know, not necessarily the tools to actually allow us to create applications. So I know for myself, I, I can't, I, I had a hard time really kind of wrapping my head around why I should care about this. But I, I really should because one, from a performance standpoint, it's ridiculously fast. It's close to the metal now. I remember back in the day not wanting to learn JavaScript. I just had to, you know, because it was here to stay. I'm now viewing web components kind of the same way as I used to look at JavaScript, except for I decided to embrace it. But there are other tools here like Slim.js, you got um, Skate, um, what is that, Skate.js, uh, uh, Skate yeah, at the bottom right one there is Skate.js, uh, there's Xtag, and then my favorite is Stencil. It is a fairly newcomer on the block. But, oh my gosh, picking up a lot of traction. Now, the reason that Stencil came on my radar is because 
I've been developing Ionic mobile apps or mobile apps using the Ionic framework. And Stencil was actually created by the folks at Ionic because, and I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent here, but I, it's, it's interesting, the history. Ionic 1 was built on Angular JS, the very first version of Angular. Ionic 2 is based on Angular 2, which is not just an upgrade to Angular 1. It's actually a complete rewrite, right? Ionic 3 is based on Angular 3 and, well, excuse me, Angular 4 and up. There is no Angular 3. Angular 2 and up, you know, it, it, it kind of the same world. Well, what Ionic is built off of, it, originally it was built on the Angular stack, really. Everything in Ionic was based on Angular. Well, they quickly realized after starting that that was not going to be able to last for long, right? They needed to evolve as a framework. Separately. They needed to allow someone that wanted to build a mobile app using Vue to actually do that. But the way they architected the whole solution in the beginning, it was very Angular. I mean, there was no other way other than Angular. So in Ionic 2 and Ionic 3, you're creating Angular components and you're using Angular components in the mobile app. All right? You're not using web components. Well, Ionic 4, complete game changer. They created Stencil, and I'm pulling this full circle back now, to create web components that would replace all of their Angular components in Ionic 3. So, so they decoupled. Three, they, uh, they're, yes. Thank you. Decoupled. That's exactly what they did. They decoupled from Angular. So now I can create an Ionic framework-based mobile app in Ionic 4 using Vue. I could use React if I wanted to. Because all of the components are pure web components. Those same web components can be used in any other application too. Right? Um, uh, uh, Stencil is simply a group of web components that have been built. Actually, no. Sorry. I, thank you for asking the question because I probably blurred to, it's, it's so familiar to me, I'm not describing it very right. It's not a library. It's a tool to generate web components. Oh, it's, a, okay. it's an application. It's a, it's tooling. Okay. So have you used <laughs> MV Quick thing? It's tooling, but it's using NPM, it's using uh, Gulp, it's using Yarn, these tools to actually help you with your workflow. Mm -hmm. That's what Stencil is, and I'm going to go take okay. a closer look right. here at what Stencil is. All right? It is, think of it as, an, as a compiler that generates web components. More specifically, it creates custom elements, one of the four specifications within web components. Uh -huh. right? right? So you create your code in Stencil, and you compile it, and the output is pure HTML and pure JavaScript. Pure. No dependencies on Angular, no dependencies on Vue, no dependencies on any other framework. Right? I've got a question. So, like, if, let's just consider the context of DNN. You want to use a DNN module that uh, uses web components, and you want to get out of business of the DNN API. Like, so, how can you get the user username, all that stuff, like, into a web component if it's just HTML, CSS, JavaScript. I mean, is it web services or you have variables or like? You, you know, How do you want to do it? Do you do it? You actually do it today. It's just that you can actually, let's say you are creating a classic um, ASP.NET control-based, you know, ASCX-based module. Yeah. How do you render data into HTML. You could do it from the server side, right? Yeah. You call the server side API, and that renders a block of information into the HTML DOM. Right. This is no different. I can use a web component. If I'm in the context of a classic DNN module, I get the data server side, and I inject it into the HTML, the custom element. 
because it's just HTML. There's nothing fancy there. It's not like there's some application going on or anything like that. It is just HTML and JavaScript. We'll come back to it a little bit later, and it'll probably make a little yeah, bit more I, sense. I would need to see it in code yep. for me to understand. So, so let's look a little bit more at what Stencil does. It, it also takes features such as the Shadow DOM, which is the other one of the other four specifications. <coughs> it uses <coughs> asynchronous rendering, which was inspired by React Fiber. All right, for you React lovers out there. It uses reactive data binding. It leverages TypeScript. Now remember, we're talking about the tooling here. We're not talking about yeah. custom elements at this point. This is what we're using to then compile to pure web components. All right? So is it too early to ask the question here, do I care? As in, if I'm using this tooling to if you generate, are, no, yeah. do I care what it is using? I don't care. That doesn't have to come into right. what I've built. It's right. not coming in as a dependency. I'm not referencing it, and then it shows up. This is tooling that's just spitting out at the end. This is web component based HTML. Okay. So, I mean, you don't really care about stencil if you're not planning on creating your. No, I, I mean, I'm using stencil. That's right. I'm using yeah. stencil to create my custom elements. But the fact that it has re reactive data binding, I don't care. You don't care. I mean, you because do. the end result doesn't care. You do because really you can leverage it. Sure, sure. In it. But, it's not but the end designer. result. Is it going to you know, need it? Is, is it going to need it to it's load it up? It's going to use it, but you don't care. It is going to use it. It is. You'll see. You'll okay. See. There's no dependencies though. How? What? You'll see. All right. So Black magic what it does? Uh, now nah, I'm just falling what, right into what, what is it? What is it? Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what the output here is what's what's key. It is a standards-based web component. All right. Let's look at a few other things in Stencil. It enables a number of key capabilities on top of web components. I'm just learning right. about them. I'm going to learn about right. extending them now. Well, yep. okay. Now, Andrew, this comes back to your question right here. Server-side rendering without the need to run a headless browser is supported with web components that are generated by Stencil. All right. It also supports pre-rendering. This is what makes things lightning fast. Okay. It can pre-render so much stuff there, so it doesn't have to wait for all this stuff to happen. It also supports uh, objects as properties instead of just strings. So if you've got a property on a custom element, let's say it's called um, value. All right. That's my custom element property that I've got. Value doesn't just have to be a string. It could also be an object, like a JSON object. It could be, That's for instance, powerful. a user, and inside of that you would have the name and the email and all that. That's exactly right. So it's more powerful than what you even get with standard you know, properties on HTML. All right. Stitz will also provides a great developer experience uh, with some extra APIs and a live reload feature with a little mini server. And I'll show that in action, action here in a little bit. All right, so this is all kind of the foundation for where I started. With a new collection of web components, affectionately called NV Quick Components. What else? <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> named. All right. All right, so some of my goals at the beginning were to create a solid project structure and development workflow um, based on experience with MV Quick Theme and building that. That was one of the key principles to that is really coming up with a good, solid architecture for the tooling and the whole workflow of creating themes. And same is true here for MV Quick Components. Wanted to have a solid structure and a great workflow. Right. We want the output to be easily consumable for developers via NPM, Node Package Manager. That's what we're used to in the modern web world, right? We want to consume components, in this case, web components, by just installing from NPM. We also want to make this open source on GitHub so the community can contribute. All right, so let's look at the basics 
I took one simple example, a progress bar. And I wanted that progress bar to take full advantage of the shadow DOM because I just thought that was some cool stuff right there. I wanted to see what this mysterious attached DOM looked like. I wanted to use the element decorator inside of the stencil world to access the host element from within the class instance. I uh, wanted it to return an instance of an HTML element so that standard DOM methods and events can be used. All right. So if you're working with pure HTML, sometimes you tap into certain methods and events on that DOM. So like you want to add an event listener to a particular div, right? You can do that, right? That's built into the world of HTML and JavaScript. I want to do the same thing with this custom element. I want to be able to use all of those known things that I would expect to be there. I want them to work with this custom element. I also wanted to use prop decorators uh, for configurability with the HTML attributes. So these are properties. There's three ways to use the properties. You can use dash case on the custom element. So if you're, I'll show you an example in just a minute, but like let's say your property name um, on the HTML, it will be my dash value, mm -hmm. you know, or max dash value that it'll use a dash case. Dash case versus camel case. Oh, no, you mentioned camel yeah. case. Okay. Now, in JSX, all right, and it's going to use camel case. So this is all naming methodology that's standards-based, all right? So it can get a little bit confusing because it's not the same in one context as it is in the other. Don't know why they did that. I don't really know, um, but it is different. And then I also want to be able to access that, uh, that property via JavaScript and manipulate those properties via JavaScript. That's what you would expect with HTML on a div or any other kind of mm -hmm. HTML element. So why should we not be able to do this on uh, my little progress bar here too? I also wanted to tap into the use of custom SAS variables or sometimes called shorthand properties to allow for style manipulation from within the component, so within what I'm creating the component with, or by the end developer that is using or consuming the component in their application. You may say, well, all right, great, now you're bringing in a SAS dependency. No, no, it's all pure JavaScript uh, and HTML. You'll see in a little bit, but it is leveraging SAS variables if we want it to. <laughs> Fun stuff. So let's look a little bit at what this looks like in HTML. So we're looking at the HTML here. We've got two instances of the progress bar, custom element, on the page. The first instance is using the value attribute right inside of the HTML. Mm -hmm. It's setting that value in the HTML, just like you would setting the SRC attribute on an image tag, right? It's the same thing. It's just we're in a custom element. The second instance is doing some more powerful stuff. Not only is it setting the value and the max property, inside the HTML, but it's also applying a class to it. That's not something I had to build into the component, right? But the name that I use for the class is called styled because I wanted to give the, the developer the ability to use the style that's built into the component if I want to. Then, look, there's some inline styling here now. In the real world, I would not recommend inline styling here, but this is just for uh, yeah, demonstration here. But what you see here is mvq progress bar dot style. Mm -hmm. That now has a SAS property called progress color, and it's setting it to red. This all looks pretty simple, but it's illustrating some very powerful features here 
So let's see it in action. I'm going to flip out of here and I'm going to try to get my display to not to mirror now so that I can work off of here. Everybody seeing that okay? I'll tell you in two seconds. It's green right now. Gray screen? Uh, yeah, view now. Yeah, now it's screen sharing is stopped. Oh, yeah? Yep. Interesting. All right, how about now? And, uh, Bingo. Code. All right, you're seeing code now? Yep, and it's fairly readable. All right. Very size. Zoom in so I will yeah, zoom in more um, on this, but what we're going to do first is I'm going to flip over here into terminal. Now, don't get too lost on me here. What I've got is I've got a project here in Visual Studio Code. This is my stencil development environment, all right? And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'm just going to give you kind of the lay of the land here. This one component, mvq-progressbar, progress-bar, it has two files. One is a TSX file. Now, That's for those of you file. familiar with JSX, TSX is just TypeScript JSX. <laughs> All right, so this is a React. Um, Andrew, you probably explained this a little bit better than I can, but JSX is a common uh, view, if you will, in React that renders components. All right. So uh, I've also got a SAS file here that you'll notice some just standard SAS in here. You'll see that I've got a few variables in here. Uh, the interesting thing to point out here is colon post. Now what that is, is the shadow DOM. All right? You'll notice in the TSX file, I've got shadow set to true here right on my component directive. Now, what gets rendered is just this. All right, lines 20 through 23. It's just a div with a particular class on it that I have defined in my SAS, and then two divs, one to actually render the bar, and one that renders the remainder or shows the remainder of the bar that's not colored. All right? So okay. all I'm going to do here is I'm going to, in my terminal, I'm going to run, oops, excuse me, get rid of this. All right, I'm going to run npm start. <coughs> now what this is going to do, it's actually going to build my project, and it's going to start up a little mini HTML server, all right, a little web server here, and I'm now looking at my folders that are in that project. So I'm going to go to examples because that's where I've got my little example HTML laid out, and I've got two different versions here. I've got both a local version and then I've got what the rest of the world would see if they were consuming it from NPM. They're exactly the same HTML. I can switch back over and show you that in just a minute. But I'm going to run the local version of the MD Quick progress bar. Now we're looking at a page, and I'm going to go into inspect here. And if it will cooperate with me, I'm going to go into responsive mode so that you can see a little bit better. All right. And I'm going to refresh the page. And I don't have that big question. Okay, why is that not showing that right now? Hmm, I said I would have done it. For some reason, it's chopping off my mm -hmm. right hand side. All right, let me go out of responsive mode because something's lacking that up. Oops. What? Uh, mm. Nope, I'm about to do it here. Okay. All right, so this is a little wide here, and I'm going to make it, make it big. <clears throat> it's okay. Hey, is that getting bigger when you're in? No. No. Is it now? Yes. Okay, there we go. All right, so let me flip back over and show you the actual HTML that is rendering this page. Because you'll see up here in the top, it's local nvq progress bar html So I'm going to go back over into my code here. Right up here is my examples folder. This is my local example, and this is the HTML. The only, everything should look very familiar here, 
except for this line, which is just loading the output JavaScript file from our build. All right? All of the components are in a single JavaScript file called MVQ components. That's the folder that it gets rendered to with stencil. All right? The other thing here are the two, what you saw on the PowerPoint presentation. The first one is just setting the value in the HTML attribute on the element. And the second one is setting two properties or attributes on the custom element and setting the class to style. All right? Split back over. Let's see what happens here. All right, so this is rendered on the page. Let's look at the, uh, the body here. So inside of the body, you'll see the HTML here. Just what you would expect. All right. When I open up that first one, now remember it's got two custom elements on the same page. Notice what you see right under the element. Shadow dash root. This is the shadow DOM. It's just laying right there in plain sight. Yep, like right there. Right there. But my, my class here for progress uh, dash container, that's inside of the component. So look over here. The styles is colon host, then the style, progress dash container. That's what's in my SAS file right over here. All right? Progress dash container. But that is not accessible or cannot apply to totally. anything outside of this element right there. Mm -hmm. That's the shadow bond. Now, let's say I want to change the value on this first one to right now, uh, the max is set to 100. You'll see over here in the style, it's already set from the SAS. Max value is defaulted to 100. I want to change it to 60 so we can see it change, or 75. Let's go 75. So I'm changing the HTML. I'm hitting enter. Boom. Now the, the color has moved over to there. Nothing magical here. You didn't see a flicker of the page. It didn't reload anything. Because we're manipulating pure HTML here. This is a property on a custom element. We're just changing the value of the property via the HTML. So I'm doing this just to illustrate what's going on in there. Did not have to reload anything. All right? Let's jump over into the console and let's see what we can do here. Let's define a constant called MVQ, and you'll see I've already got some stuff in here. What I'm doing here is, is this big enough for everybody to see? or do mm -hmm. I make it No, it's, it's real. Okay. All right, so I've defined a constant and just calling it MVQ progress bar one. I'm just using pure JavaScript here to select this element, the very first instance of the MVQ progress bar on the page. I'm going to hit return. Now I've got that in that constant. So now I should be able to manipulate the property values from JavaScript, right? So I should be able to access the properties. I've got two properties on this element. Let's do the value. That's the one we manipulated on the front end just a few minutes ago. So let's set that value to, uh, let's say, um, let's go full. Let's go 100, right? Return. You'll notice the color filled up the progress bar, right? I'm just doing this from pure JavaScript. No framework, no jQuery, no anything like that. This is pure JavaScript. So if I want this progress bar to have some JavaScript, you know, progress bar kind of, behavior, I can do that. I can just sit here and manipulate the value over time based on what activity is going on. Just like you would in any other component, except for in this word, I'm doing it in pure HTML and JavaScript. All right? Let's do something a little bit more crazy. Um, let's manipulate the color of it. All right? So I'm just going to do JavaScript here again. I'm going to do uh, my constant name dot style dot set property, all right? 
I've got a, a SAF property in there of dash dash progress color, dash color, right? That's in my stencil project, right? Remember, it just gets rendered out as JavaScript and HTML. But I'm going to set it to purple here. Oops. Let's just choose the first one here. As soon as I hit enter, boom, our color has changed to purple. Pure JavaScript. All right, so we've done several things here. We've manipulated it from HTML. It's rendered. It uses the shadow DOM. We've manipulated property values from HTML and from JavaScript. And we have used SAS variables to manipulate the color, in this case, on the custom element. I'm going to flip back over into presentation here. Well, actually, I'll go back over the code here. And I want to get very too far into code, but the output, I want to show this to you, gets rendered right here. This is the JavaScript file. Notice it says built with it, but this is all very minified, very <laughs> um, optimized. This is all that you have to include on your HTML on your app. So think of this as your app. It is using that JavaScript. It's importing that JavaScript file. Then I can use from that the custom HTML tags, elements, and I can leverage the everything that is built into that, including the SAS variables. Have minds been blown a oh, little yeah. bit? Uh, in the chat windows, you have had uh, Daniel joke that uh, if he wins uh, one of the raffle tickets later, could he just take a, a bottle of aspirin instead of uh, <laughs> instead of a ticket because he could use that. Um, and I probably lost the screen there. Uh, let me know if you. We see both screens at the moment. Oh, we see, see your slide. We see your your, your controller screen. Uh, we see next slide okay. and your timeline. I'll change that over back to the presentation. Let me know if you can see that okay. The aspirin thing was a joke, though. It's very interesting. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> um, do we have any questions? Uh, David, you're, you're kind of... Uh, I've got a few more of, slides, but that's about it. Right, you're, you're, you're kind of at a middle today. point, and, we, and some of the next things we look at will be further examples to, to kind of hone in on things. Um, circling back to just a couple of previous questions. Um, one that Andrew mentioned that I was thinking about was that the fact that these styles are now inside of the shadow DOM and they are scoped inside of that means you can't, they can't affect other things, but on the off of flip side, they can't be reused by anything. Therefore, doesn't that imply a loss of That's efficiency? Absolutely. That's why you put them there. They can't be used in other elements, though. If that's what you're doing. Right, and so then that other Just element also element. needs similar styles or the same styles, you have to list them again. Doesn't that create some extra duplication of things that might not have been duplicated otherwise? Or, I'm oh, sorry, wait, actually. Maybe, but everything's very specific to the feature sure. that you're building in that component. That's a fair so, point. Yeah. But at the same time, because they can be linked to, you don't have to necessarily worry about them being different from each other, as in one is an older version and one's a newer version. You can have them linking to the same resource um, SAS file so that they are, I mean, they're, so still gonna the be built, they're still going to be built in the same thing, but in your tooling, you're using the same one that has all your core stuff. That's right. So, so, so the thing that I, I've said it a few times, but it may not have clicked yet, the output of this is a JavaScript file. Right. It's one block of notice, instructions. Notice is I did not your say content. styles. Notice I didn't say SAS. I didn't even say CSS. Mm -hmm. It is a JavaScript file. In fact, it's not even a JavaScript file. It's just JavaScript well, it code. Is a JavaScript. It is a text. JavaScript file, yeah. It's literally a file. Yeah. But you use the text that it's a reference. Right. That's right. It is a file. But there's no SAS in there. The SAS was used in your tooling right. to help you generate. Right. And so what I was meaning is that for our organization's sake, your SAS then can help you keep things organized. You can put several things in it at the same time that you're using across a couple other tools if there's common ones. But 
at the end of the day, it gets the things that are necessary get rendered into your end result JavaScript. You're not linking to that. You're not referencing that. It was just right. used in the build. Right. Um, but that the the question the question was, does that have a small downside in the fact that 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 gets rend that gets generated into the one JavaScript file for one component and into another JavaScript file for another component? So there's a little bit of lack of reuse because this it is, is scoped. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're bringing up a good point. But for it to be independent of any other framework, is that's actually what it's for, is isolation. So every component is completely isolated. So that you're only using only what you need to use in um, order to use it. <laughs> um, Daniel was uh, kind of also talking about the tooling and said, you know, if he didn't want to use um, some of these these tooling uh, helpers to help build, um, let's see. Then his question was, if he was working in it directly, does it have a um, a React style? Let's see what you see. Uh, help me out, uh, Daniel. You want to bring it up, but you were saying basically, if you didn't want to use uh, the tool, does that have React actual data bind? It was not me. Ah, it wasn't. Oh, it was Mike. So, Mike, uh, pipe, uh, uh, chime in. What was the what was the question? Well, let's look back to Mike. I mean, the, the how about data binding if it's built in into the web components natively? So in this case, Stencil uses reactive data binding. Mm -hmm. It is reactive data binding. So what you would expect in React, that's what this is doing. But, but on these other tools, but on its own, have different if it's doing web components directly, there is not data binding in web components directly. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. That doesn't mean that you can't implement data binding using some other framework like a knockout or like an As Angular sure. or any of that, you can still bind the way that the framework does. It just doesn't have anything built into it natively to do the binding. So what I just did in the browser by changing the HTML and hitting enter, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have actually updated the screen. That's using reactive data binding right there to actually re-render the control or the component or the element, <laughs> I should say. Okay. That's I what I, I, sorry? I have another question. Uh, you know the color you used a SAS variable name? Can you expose standard CSS values like just color, just background color for designers to use it as any other HTML element? Yeah, a absolutely you can. And those are really properties at that point. Yeah. So what what I will do here, because um, I, I think we have a little bit of time, mm -hmm. right? Um, yep. I do want to get to the last few slides, but I'm going to share my other screen here. And if I can get that to apply. While you're searching, <laughs> questions keep coming up. Can you okay. override? A standard HTML element. I'm, I missed the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You want it's what to? Oh, you said something about overriding a standard HTML element. You yeah, want or what? Fin finish what? with this, and I'll come back with the question so we don't overlap. Okay. Yeah. So to restate the question, you were saying, can you um, correct me if I'm wrong? But you were saying something like a, a, a color. For yeah, let's, let's suppose uh, instead of using the, the SAS variable that you're using there, that we could use just color and background color. Yeah, so you could actually create props or properties on this. So you would simply have in here prop color. And then you can, that would be a string, obviously, or you could do it as a, you know, probably do it as a string. And you can set the default of that to, let's just say, you know, FFF, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Or you probably do something like, you know, black or whatever. Would be the, ah, I can't type. All right. And then, sorry. And then in your actual SAS, you would still do it 
this this way, you'd probably create a variable that says what black means and then actually apply that by setting that property style based on the, the property value that comes in. So like here I'm in the render function and EL is just the HTML element itself, right? So I'm accessing the element and setting, just like I did in the console, I'm setting the property so I can sit here and say this dot L dot style. Ah, my typing is awful. Set property. Um, and then I could read whatever this is. You know, this would probably just still be, uh, I can't remember what it was, color, progress color or something like that. Dash color, right? I would set, actually, no, here. We could still use this, but I would do here, I would access the property, the SAS variable, right? Say progress dash, uh, dash color. And then here, this dot color, all right, dot to string. Mm. Does that make sense there? Totally. So then whatever value gets set on the property itself gets translated through the sets. Awesome, which makes it very easy for designers. They don't have to learn anything. They could use standard. Exactly. So you're just creating a framework, a little bit of tooling around this HTML element, this custom element, to allow the developer or designer to have full control over the styling and the features of that or the values that get placed in there. And we're only touching a few things here, you know, but we're using properties and SAS variables here to do that. There's more to it. So you can do more stuff. But, yeah, that uh, answers the question. Yep. The other question that popped out is, can you override a standard HTML element? For instance, uh, it's very hard to style uh, HTML dropdowns so that it works cross browser. Let's suppose you make a custom dropdown as a web component that will replace the standard dropdown. Is that something possible? I mean, it might replace it in your usage, so you yeah. can use it instead of using a standard one, right? That's that's the answer I was going to go with. Yeah. You would then use the custom element as opposed to the standard element, hmm. <laughs> which Maybe. is also an an LMS, but it's an HTML element. It's not a custom HTML. Namespace wise, it won't let you create a web component called image, or nope. it won't let you create a web component nope. called and option, uh, right? Or and select. That, right? that actually goes back to the whole naming, right? You know, standards that are in place there. The dash based. I'm curious. Sure, what would it do? You just ignore it. It won't. It just won't run. It just ignores it, or would give you an error. You can't or do it because the naming standards enforce that you can't use the same name as the as the HTML element that's in the HTML standard. It, it won't render. So yeah. It won't even work. Okay. Yeah. So let me flip back over. Now, I'll try to finish these last couple of slides here real quick because I do want to pull it back full circle to DNN. Uh, this won't take but a, a few minutes, and then we can open it up for any questions that you'd like. Uh, is everybody seeing my presentation yes, slide? Yep. Okay, good. So, as mentioned earlier, this, this effort is in its infancy stage, but it is on GitHub. Right now, I've started on three components. Uh, one is the progress bar that I've shown you here, which really I didn't do that strategically. I just thought that would be a good thing to visually show some of the various features that are possible in it. I started a label control because that seems to be the crux of a lot of people's complaints with the DNN label controls uh, that are there in web forms right now. Uh, so there's a simple label control in there already. But I've also started on a more complex one too, and it's called MB Quick Editor. And this is using the Quill Editor that's out there. So if, if you've had an appetite for a better editing experience, 
uh, or a different editing experience, more modern editing experience. CK Editor is great. Our implementation of CK Editor in the Denon space is not so great, um, but hopefully that will, like you guys go through jumping through a few hoops to make CK Editor hum like you want it to. So um, jump right in, contribute what I would love to see happen, and I'll, let me just circle back to that one. <laughs> what I'd love to see happen. I'm going to talk about that with the future. Um, so let's talk about the current state of DNN and what components or controls even are, are available. So starting kind of with old school, you've got the ASP.NET controls. Well, obviously that has a dependency on ASP.NET framework. You know, um, are you including Teller controls in there? Any controls that are server-side controls, you know, here that's one way to get a, you know, quote, component feature, but obviously that has the dependency on the underlying ASP.NET framework. You've got jQuery where you can use jQuery widgets, you know, and plop them in there. You go out and find a nice little date picker widget from jQuery. You can plop it in there because DNN has jQuery. And then you realize the version of jQuery and DNN is different than the version that you really need for that little widget, and you may run into some troubles there. You can do some cool things with data binding and things like that with Knockout, with Angular, React, and Vue.js, even within the context of DNN as it exists today, through SPA, as well as MVC, and I've seen some people even use those frameworks within the context of uh, a web forms-based module. In the persona bar, we have the dnn.react.common repository, which is a collection of components. They are React components, all right? So everything that you see in the persona bar that is a component, that was using the dnn.react.common library of components. Um, you also can use other components like Angular components and Vue components and all that in the context of the persona bar. A lot of people don't realize that, but you can. You don't have to use React. Uh, persona bar is really just a, an iframed in HTML blob, right? So whatever you choose to load into your little world there, your little extension in the persona bar, you could build that in Vue, you could build it in Angular, you could build it in pure HTML and JavaScript if you wanted to. Now, in the future, I see us moving away from these framework dependent components. I see us moving into a world of web components and leveraging those so that we become more and more framework agnostic to where we could use a framework if we wanted to, or not. Our components would not be dependent on those frameworks. Daniel agrees 2,000%. So hopefully I've been able to share a little bit that helps enlighten you about some of the modern things that are happening in the HTML world. And you know, if you have a glazed look over your eyes or some of this really doesn't make sense, let me know because I'd love to talk about it even more. Uh, I'm still green at this. I'm learning a lot, but there's still a lot to be learned. Uh, I still want to make it more complicated than it really is <laughs> at times. Uh, but when you start kind of thinking about creating components, web components, custom elements, all kinds of questions come up. And some of those came up tonight, so I really appreciate the questions. Uh, but there, you'll have more as you dig deeper into this. You know, what really is the scope of the component that I'm creating? How far can I go with it? How far should I not go with it? <laughs> you know, where does the actual component leave off and my implementation of the component later within the context of an application pick up? You know, um, so lots of questions. So one question 
that I think you were leading towards is where does this go next? Where do you focus on it? Where do, and I don't mean you, I mean in general, where do people focus on, where do they go next with this? Um, I can see and envision using this within your own work to then create templates of very light um, things that are using as few other libraries and as few other frameworks as necessary to then put together stuff that then could go into multiple different platforms, multiple different environments and run virtually the same across the board or probably by definition the same across the board. So that is what I start to think of with, with, with things that we try to develop. Um, some of what you're building here so far with your NV Quick Components are controls, are specific things that help us in the development of other things. So it's almost like a, a macro versus micro kind of approach. When you started playing around with it, you started thinking about controls, things to replace that maybe are right now a dependency on older framework stuff. So was that, was that the biggest need? Was that the worst painful offense in, um, in you know, thinking about, you know, I'm going to sit down and if any possible Telerik controls is still in place, I'm going to think about replacing those with a better example. Every time I have to load up a jQuery uh, calendar, instead I'm going to work on making one so I am free of jQuery. So that's like micro. That's elements that you're going to use in larger project work versus larger project work to do or to build something. Have you played around with doing or building something with this yet? Yes. Or you're only doing little component items that then you're going to consume in your larger, your larger things? Yes and yes. <laughs> okay. so, so, I mean, part of building something like this, you have to test it out. Yeah, right? you've got to you tinker know, and figure exactly, out what you're doing. Exactly. So I've been building the examples that are inside of the, the repo uh, that you'll see, and I probably should pull that up too just in case... Uh, Oh, that wasn't yes, that. clear uh, where it is. GitHub slash in, or GitHub.com slash Ambitionative slash MB Quick Components is where it is now. There's no fancy documents out here or readme files yet. It is literally just the source of what is there right now. Uh, I do plan on growing this out just a little bit here, but feel free to clone this and you know take a look at it. Uh, you'll have to know a little bit about Stencil in order to do that because, remember, this is the tooling to create what the output is. The output is in the disk. So, you know, if you wanted to consume this, then you would just use that one JavaScript file. You can also find this on npm, js.com, slash package, slash at envisionative, slash nb dash or components, sorry, mbq-components. Don't have a lot of stuff out here, but you'll see it's version 0.0.3. .0 but all you have to do to install that is from your command line, run in, if you have npm installed, you just do npm i, which is install, and it's at envisionative, which is the organization, and then it's mbq-components. So that's how you would actually install that into your app. Dave, I was looking at, can you guys hear me okay right now? No. It's pretty low, pretty soft. Is that any better? Yes. Yes. All right. So I was looking at the, uh, the NV Quick Components uh, GitHub project that you have. And there are the examples. There are two folders, local and NPM. And I noticed on the local, it's referencing what you build locally there versus NPM references uh, you know, what you were just showing up on NPM. And my question is, what's the best practice for using web components? Is it referencing like it's being referenced in the NPM folder, or is it building, or is it uh, uh, downloading it locally and uh, referencing it from that? Yeah, the best practice would be to install it into your, your app, use an NPM install, and it's ultimately going to reference the local copy of that. But that way you can actually control, like for instance, you'll see a little mistake on this one. Out here in the repo, mm -hmm. I'm referencing version 0.0.2. .0 .0 well, that may be what you want to use. 
maybe you want to use 0 .0 0.0.3 because you know that's got some other cool stuff in it that you want to use. That's one of the power of NPM is you can really get version specific and, and install what you want. If you always want the latest and greatest, then of course you just run the install command the way it is here. And I don't know why they make this so small that you can't yeah, read the rest of it, yeah. but it is just in the q-components there. Um, um, I, I was going to pull this up real quick to, to show what one of the first goals could look like. Um, I mentioned earlier the dnn.react.common. What if all of these components were replaced with pure web components, custom elements, as opposed to having a dependency on React? Wouldn't that be great? Then we could demystify the whole persona bar extension development, and people wouldn't feel like if they didn't know React, they wouldn't be able to do it, because I guarantee that's the way people feel now. They think they have to know React in order to build persona bar extensions. And the reality is you don't, but there is no documentation out there that shows how to do that in a non-React way. But that's kind of beside this point. If these components were rebuilt to be pure custom elements, wouldn't that be great? Because then we could use those components not only in Persona Bar, but we could use it in our extensions that we're developing, our modules, and more. Other apps that are in WordPress, <laughs> we can use those same same components. So do you view this as being used in modules or potentially replacing modules? Yes. That's a good question. So I think what you're alluding to, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying, could I build a custom element that actually is a full featured module. Yeah. You can. That's like where the, where would the line stop? You can. It, it becomes less usable or re reusable at that point because you're tailoring an entire application. And I'll, I'll use an example here to, uh, to really make that here. Um, if you go to stencilj.s.com, for instance, this entire website is built on, on it is an actual app of custom elements, the entire website. So when I click this, it's actually, oops, did I lose internet connection there? Um, we, we see your mouse moving. So you're still live. Is anybody hearing us online? Yes. I still hear you. Oh, interesting. Okay, I, just, I see people freezing on my end. So no, and I'm also not able to. We still have 12 folks on and everything. Anyway, well, so the point is, is, you can build very robust applications using this as well. So Daniel did ask a question that could tie into this because um, Clint was asking, could you use this to build a thing that becomes like a module? And or do you just use it to build parts of things that you use? Um, Daniel asked, uh, does it allow for nesting? Are you able to build web components that then call other web components inside of themselves? Could you build a web calendar, uh, a web component that's a, a, a calendar, and then you call that calendar from within another web component that's actually a whole little modulate thing? Does, um, does nesting exist? Yes, it does. And but then that. you're creating an application of web components. You can do a stencil app, for instance, you know, to, to do that, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't really see it, you know, not that you can't do it or shouldn't do it or anything like that, but that's definitely not on my radar to try to solve any of that stuff right now. I really want to look at these key components that are out there and recreate these things mm -hmm. in pure. It sounded like Mitchell was in favor yeah. of replacing the control panel React components with these uh, web, components. web components. Yeah. Um, just one more thing about the nesting there. That nesting potential means that the shadow DOM can be nested and the shadow DOM can have elements inside of it that have its own shadow DOM? Or no? <laughs> no. Okay. No. Each, each element, each custom element is a bottom level. Own, it could leverage the shadow DOM. Yeah. Period. 
<laughs> Pete joined in with another aptly timed yo dog. <laughs> that, and, uh, no, we can't do that, Brandon. Nice. Um, okay. Um, so we were kind of in the middle of uh, you know group questions here. Um, David, did you want to? Were you going to go back around to and show uh, just a visual maybe on screen of one of the other components, like your label? It's on the screen now. It is now, yep. Uh, and your, your quill, oh, use quill the, based uh, editor, all right. Should use the label first, I guess. Okay. So this is a simple label that you hover over it, and there's the, the help. Super simple. The editor at this point is pretty full power. And uh, I even one day went and downloaded this and got it running on my machine, and then I changed the style by changing a property or something, right? Yep. Nice. So if I want to put it, uh, I'm just down. I'm saying you can get it running like it's pretty. I have no idea what these pictures are on my computer. Oh, that's it's really it's really right. uh, so I can, not over. I can put. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's my image in there. You know, it's a huge image, obviously. Uh, this is a, becoming a very popular editor out there. It's called Quill. It's called Quill. And uh, I think it's at quilljs.com. So this is utilizing Quill. Now, that was an interesting experience in of itself. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll mention here is that this particular component is not utilizing the Shadow DOM. Because I haven't figured out yet how to load in the external because JavaScript. it's really loading in JavaScript really loading to the in thing. Another sure. thing that, so this component is dependent on another yeah, sure. component. So that image, like if you were to upload an image, right, you click the image thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the context of a DNN site, like would you have a folder picker or? Like yeah. So that, so this is the thing. So a lot of yeah. people don't even realize this in our current world, the CK editor can run standalone. And it'll look a lot. I mean, oh, not, not look like yeah, that. Yeah, it'll yeah. behave like this. Yep. But notice there is no submit button. There is no let me look at all the folders on my server when I click this. No, I'm looking local and I'm uploading, but where is it going to? Right. Well, in this case it's actually loading into the browser memory. Right. And you have to actually do something with it. You have it. to wire so, it up. So yeah. we have in DNN an HTML editor provider. Mm -hmm. So there's an actual provider that wraps the CK editor. Right. The CK editor becomes right. the CK editor provider, which ties right. in and says, okay, of this element of CK editor that manages to allow you to upload something, tie it into this recipient. Yes. It's going to take it and then save it. And so all the features yeah, that are that are in CK editor right. have to be extended mm -hmm. or connected yep. to the various elements within DNN's context. Right. So it would be no different with MB Quick Editor. There would have to be a provider that consumes the web yeah. component and, and hooks everything up and to we've, DNN. We've done some things like that in the past with other very simple, uh, simple editors. Um, and then you, you jump through a hoop or two and you can get it so that it will allow uploads and put them to the right place and reference them and stuff. So here, David, your web component version, you got this loaded up, but there isn't a tie yet for anything that gets uploaded. It's just available, so then you can connect it to whatever you're going to do with it, right? That's right. Okay. Yep, this is all client side. Yeah. So it would have to be you know, wired up. So what, uh, what some of the folks in the chat were, were joking about or egging you on about, uh, David, was that they're pretty sure what they heard you say a little bit ago was that you were going to go through those DNN React components and just start going through them and replacing them, and that was going to be your new goal. And in about a month or so, you'd be done completely. <laughs> um, they're pretty sure that that's what you're, they heard you say. I'm pretty but, uh, sure everybody needs to go to the uh, audiologist and okay. check their hearing there. But um, what, I'll, what I'll commit to is taking a look at this NV Quick Editor so that I can understand it as a way for me to learn web components and understand this a little bit more with practice. So you want to jump off the deep end right yeah, away. Yeah, then, right? From the start with it. it is very complex. But so. it's the one that I'm ready to work with because I can tie this into XMOD. Yep. I could take this and, and have XMOD be the brains that's then going to save data records, 
handle the file um, processing and I could turn this into a component that is usable inside of Xmon Pro as an alternate HTML editor. And that's something I can wrap my head around. So I will, uh, we'll take that and maybe by the time we have, uh, oh, Ryan's presenting next month. No, 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 I am, but I'm pretty sure that I heard him say that he I had heard about it. it. I was just going to say by summit, I could tell you that it's worked. Uh, so it's time next week. I mean, next month, right? <laughs> Yeah, you, you'll notice when you get into the code here, there's quite a bit that's been done already. There's a lot of placeholders for future stuff. There are tons of properties that you can turn on, on and turn fill, on. Uh, yeah, I bet. And they have to all be wired up. So mm -hmm. um, it's really a, I mean, it's interesting. I'll show you uh, something here that you can do. Check this out. I'll go into inspect on this. And let's say you uh, want an even more simple editing experience here. Let's go, let's find that element. Let's, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it this way or not. I'll try and we'll see. But I understand the concept, certainly. Well, I was going to show you the other theme. Like, it has two themes built into it. I can't remember if it'll Sorry. switch it like this, but it has something called a bubble editor. No, okay. Got a so what I'll have to do is I'll have to put it into the HTML real quick. So yeah, I think you showed local. Yeah, because yeah, I remember doing this and I changed it. I was like, man, like, yeah. it's going to be on load. Yeah, and it didn't work. Yeah, that, there's something, and that's because it's not on Shadow DOM, so it can't do the reactive binding on that property. Right. So I'm going to change the theme in the actual HTML right. here to bubble. And then we will reload this. Well done. All right, so you say, well, where the hell is the editor, right? Click it, click it. It's actually there. Click so it. If I come in here, I'm actually editing, right? Well, let's highlight something. Oh, oh my gosh! Oh, what? That's beautiful. All right, so I've got a full blown kind of editor that's contextual. All I did was highlight what I want to do. That is slick as everything. Then, Could you imagine training a, a, a user on this? <laughs> they're, they're just going to be mind numb. That's true. All right. So I didn't I didn't have to enter that or anything, right? But now that is a, a link, right? So yeah, it's uh, fun stuff. I love that, that <laughs> bubble editor. That is insane. <laughs> so yeah, now that's a link. Jeez. But yeah, no, it's being hidden a little bit there. There's some stuff, but yeah, so pretty interesting. I mean, that's that's a little radical for for a lot of things, but it's like I'm, I'm we have inline editing in CNN, but this is like inline editing on steroids, right? Literally you would almost have to on the style page. it so that when you were inline editing, it looked different, so that people would realize they were actually editing. But I mean, still put a picture on the page, right? Can you drag and drop? That was question. Sure. Uh, I don't know. It does support it, I believe, but not the way it is in, in the quick. Well, uh, we are reaching about 8:40. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure that we don't have people drop off before we have our ability to celebrate our new sponsor and uh, and and get to that award. So um, let's uh, let's do just a couple of things here. Community. Group-wise, and everyone who's on the chat, were there any other questions that we didn't get to that we want to take a look at now? Clint, anybody? Uh, no, I don't see any people are giving David kudos. Yep, yep. All right. Yeah, you're getting a great presentation all the way around. So we, we should, uh, as a group, okay. Uh, thank you very much, David, for an excellent um, in-depth review and training and testing and um, sleuthing so that you can make this bite-sized and presentable because that's not easy. Um, uh, I remember how in the very early days when the DOM was introduced, it broke your head to think <laughs> about what the DOM was doing. And then when you realized what you could do with it, you were, you were static. It was, it, was, it was hyper. It was amazing. This is kind of the cusp of the same thing. I. I I can see, uh, I can see that, and it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Andrew's saying he's going to use the components in his MV sizzle. All right. Oh, all right. So um, thank you very much, uh, David, for putting that together. Uh, we'll look for your updates as we start to get all of those web components replaced out. 
Uh, in seriousness, though, uh, David did explain that he's making it open source so that the community can get involved as well. He would like to have people help him and work with him in this vision, I am sure. So uh, that's you watching this later in a replay, uh, getting excited and deciding to help pitch in. Maybe you just set up some style work. Maybe you just set up some ideas on things that David's already done and you extend them a little further. Or maybe he sets the framework and you start filling in the blanks. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a place where we can all join in. Well, uh, thank you everybody who's been on uh, for the meeting today. I'm going to bring it back around to our brand new sponsor, uh, the Caribbean uh, Dev Conference. Again, that Caribbean Dev Conference is in the end of October, which is really not too... F I mean, it's, it's obviously right around the corner, but it's not so far away that you can't still go. You could plan, and this could be a surprise conference, that you let your family know that you're all going and uh, they're going to love you for it. Uh, maybe you've got some youngsters and school just started back and a month after school starts, bam, you're taking them on a Caribbean vacation hot dog. Um, so uh, two or three things about this. Um, number one, um, I'm going to read this out loud to make sure I don't have this wrong, but um, as described from... Um, ooh, uh, Andrimel Carrasco, the marketing specialist with Caribbean Developers Conference who reached out to us and, and communicated with David, um, they are saying we want to extend a, 20, uh, a discount of 20% off to all of your members. And that is for uh, basically the uh, hotel accommodations and for ticket pricing. Uh, basically there is a... Um, 20% off code uh, that we should distribute right now within the chat channel. Was there, I can't remember what she said about distributing that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we want to be, be very, very careful for this for just a moment um, because we can distribute it uh, privately within the chat uh, because we know that the chat is not part of this line here. Uh, oh, yeah. Privately within the chat, because that doesn't get recorded. Uh, sorry if you're catching this on replay. Uh, if it's in uh, time, you could always reach out to us. But um, she sent a PowerPoint. I can pull that up. While you're you can pull that up. All right. Um, but so uh, we have that 20% off code. So we're going to post that in the chat so that you can grab it's that. Actually on the PowerPoint. So once I get that up, then you bring that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but then of course uh, our big drum roll here is that we are moving towards uh, four tickets. Um, these four tickets, uh, we're going to have these as four individual um, tickets. Let me go ahead and throw out there that if you are going to go and you and your business partner or your um, significant other wants to have a ticket for the event and um, you only have one event, uh, maybe you uh, reach out to the other winners and beg them for the one that they got uh, so that you can take take use of it if you're taking multiple people. Um, but we're going to have them raffled out as four individual tickets. Uh, again, the cost or the, the price value of this is uh, around $250 for the ticket uh, to the developer conference. Uh, that, um, uh, I don't know if it's about all I can say about the, the tickets and the, the raffle here. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Um, Clint has the tickets. Uh, remember, if you look back in the chat, you have your own number that he gave you uh, a little bit earlier. And we're going to go ahead and start picking our numbers here to get our folks. Uh, uh, hey, is Andrew still on or did he have to go? Andrew Hempling is still on. Andrew Hempling is still on. Uh, Andrew, uh, you were going to head out to this conference, right? Uh, I originally was, yeah. You, you should be again. <laughs> Are we ready to you should it? originally and then should be and then go back to it again and, and change your mind and then uh, head out there. All right, Ryan, you, you turn your head. Uh, pick right. a ticket. I have got one ticket. So yeah, I've got two tickets. I've got three tickets. I've got four tickets. So I wrote the name and... Um, oh, we we got, we got names and numbers. The oh, numbers, numbers, and numbers and I wrote the names. You should be able to see the presentation now real quick. It's a very short one. Um, then we do see. Thank you. We'll go through and show if I can figure out how to advance it. Tell you what, yeah. Uh, there it is. Okay. It, there's a little bit of scenery from the Hard Rock and the venue. 
Yeah, if I didn't mention speakers? it earlier, um, registering for the conference has some information about a Shakira concert that is happening in or around that, because it is hard rock uh, related, so uh, this is going to be a party place to have a conference. Pretty nice looking resort there. And there is your discount code. Uh, do be sure to uh, take a look at that and document that if you are going to uh, potentially be using it. Southnet use dash user group. Southnet UG. So again, that is 20% off of the ticket, 20% uh, off of the uh, lodging and uh, tickets that are incorporated in that. Obviously not the airfare down. Uh, but uh, that's a pretty big, uh, a pretty big thing that they're offering to all of us uh, as, as Southern Fried DNA Music Group members. So we're thrilled. This is the kind of sponsor we love to have. Um, I have four tickets in my hand for winners, and I have. Is that camera on here? I have Adderson as ticket hello. number one. Hello, 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 hello. All right, we have Mark Buslick, uh number two. Yeah. I have Lewis Mill. Is that even in focus? I don't think so. There we go. All right, Lewis Mill. We have number. Uh, we have number three. And uh, I think Lewis may not be here. Am I? Oh, we might have to. Oh, right. You have to be oh, yeah, present. Yeah. Um, Pete, present. I don't know what you're planning, but I think you're taking your family to a developer conference. Uh, <laughs> One more. We will load you up. You could be the D uh, the Dot and Nuke uh, uh, evangelist down there and have you go. Okay. All right, so. You could give it away. You got one more. Um, so instead of uh, Lewis, uh, who Lewis isn't here Here's at the moment. Lewis in the news. Go ahead. Except for that. Okay, I got number four then. Mark. Harley. Yep. Mark Harley, you with us still? Mark Busta says uh, we can re-give away his prize. So, I mean, who wants it? Are we going to redraw? I tell you what, we uh, we have our four winners, and if anyone else is interested, you're wanting to go and you're heading down. Um, Didn't Smeltzer say he I think Smeltzer said he Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, basically, uh, please uh, text us and, and communicate with us, and we're going to make sure that uh, that it gets into your hands. Uh, we want to see some folks go down there and represent uh, DNN. And if you are heading down there, we will help you uh, head down there with some Southern Fried and some DNN swag to uh, share with folks that you meet and communicate with. Um, David, you want to say? Yeah, what we will need is, of course, we have your names. Yep. But do share with us the email address that you would like to be shared with the conference organizers there. Yep. Possibly the, the email address that you would be registering with so that we can help connect exactly. you with this, uh, this ticket. And we'll get that sent off to the organizers of the conference and then we'll get back to it with further instructions yep. on how to redeem your those tickets. But free ticket. if you're going from Nova Scotia to where is this, the Caribbean line, yep, Southern Fried kind of. is a great halfway point. You know, oh, yeah. you should stop yeah. off and see us in the yeah, way. I'm on the way back. Connecting yeah. flight in uh, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte there. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte sure. Take you the rest of the way. <laughs> All right, folks, we've had a great time tonight. Uh, I don't want to wrap it up uh, prematurely, but we're getting close here to 9 o'clock. Um, thank you, everybody, who's uh, participating with us on uh, every uh, Southern Fried DNA user group meeting. Um, we are, of course, uh, the third Thursday of uh, every month. Um, next month, uh, we will have uh, more community news and information. We'll see if we can have some more updates uh, about DNA Summit as it starts to get closer. Um, uh, I'll be doing some uh, presenting at next month's session in which we're going to do a little bit of an introduction, uh, a, a high-level introduction to structured content with a compare and contrast session uh, in which we are going to demonstrate and show uh, evoke liquid content and compare that to Community Edition DNN and the tools that you can use now and today in Community Edition to achieve the exact same things that you're achieving with Evoke Liquid Content. And we will go through in compare and contrast manner some of the pros and cons, the features and the limits of, of both of those different directions and what you can get out of those. So uh, that's, uh, that's something that we've done uh, recently in some 
client meetings and presentations, and I'm looking forward to bringing it to you uh, as well here for Southern Pride. So thank you very much, everybody. We will see you next month. Have a good one.